In the mountainous landlocked country of Laos, more than 80% of the population depends on agriculture for their livelihood. Half the households are subsistence farmers, and these buffalo are their walking bank account, each one worth around a year's salary. The economy is struggling. Inflation is running at 40%. The average price of food has doubled. The lack of food security here is real, and it's the children who are most at risk. Chronic malnutrition affects 35% of children in Laos, and it's said to be getting worse. Stunting caused by malnutrition in early childhood prevents children from reaching their full physical and cognitive abilities. It's a huge and preventable waste of human and economic potential. Yet hiding in plain sight is a highly underutilised but readily available source of protein. Despite Lao being home to 700,000 buffalo, locals don't consume the milk or products made from it. They've just never had that exposure to dairy and it's such a practical, sustainable way of providing farmers both access to nutrition and an additional income stream. Villagers can now rent their pregnant buffaloes to the country's first commercial buffalo dairy. Mrs A was the first villager to trust a phalang, or outsider, with one of her main assets. It was a big risk. Why she have to rent my buffalo and what, what are they going to do? And she don't want them to rent because she don't know, like, phalang. <laughs> The phalang in question was Susie Martin. A cheese-obsessed Australian expat, Susie opened Lau's first commercial buffalo dairy in Luang Prabang in the country's north seven years ago. Susie's unusual rental model was adapted from her old job in Singapore, leasing office space around the world. A corporate executive in another life, Susie Martin came to Lao with her family for a gap year to run a guest house. What started as a bright idea to provide guests with a more Western diet has resulted in some unexpected social and environmental outcomes. Hello, Papa. We wanted to serve guests fresh curd in the morning. I asked a local farmer if we could buy milk from their buffalo and they looked at me like I was mad. We now want to educate people on how they can look after their animals and earn extra income from them. Hi, Susie. Hey, Pip. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Welcome to Lao Buffalo Dairy. Would you like to have a go? Yeah, oh, I would. <laughs> Hello. Hey, babies. Hello, sweetie. There's not much left. That's what we call YY, very fast. Why, <laughs> why? So this is Lao's only dairy? Lao's only buffalo dairy and only dairy at the moment, yes. And you saw plenty of buffaloes when you got here. Were you surprised there was no milking at all? Honestly, we just, we didn't realise that people just, they thought milk came from fruit, like coconut. So when we would say to people, where do you think milk comes from? There was a bit of a disconnect. So was it very hard to convince a farmer to let you, this stranger white woman, mm -hmm to have your their animal for a couple of months? Yeah, I'm pretty sure for about the first 18 months, they're pretty sure we were going to barbecue them. To uh, cook them? Yeah, they really didn't know what we were going to do with their buffalo. They, they didn't know anything about dairy. So when we said, well, we're going to bring them to the farm, we're going to pay you an income, we're going to feed them, you won't have to worry about them for six to eight months, I think they probably thought it was too good to be true. Uh, and so we got a couple that were prepared to do it with us. We pay them for the $100 every time they bring a buffalo to the farm. So that's almost the equivalent of a month's salary here. After six months at the dairy, Mrs A's buffalo will return pregnant, vaccinated, in good health and with a robust calf at foot. The rental income and the occasional sale of a buffalo has helped educate her children and to buy a loom and a sugarcane juicer for the family business. It was just the start she needed to expand her herd. Mrs A now has 18 buffalo and she rents all pregnant females to the dairy.
There's a year-round supply of irrigated napier grass here, so this mum-to-be will be in the Lao version of clover for the next eight months. First, though, a bath, then three weeks quarantine. We use the external parasite treatment that we give uh, to pour on the back of the buffalo. And then later, like uh, a couple of days, we use the vaccination for foot and mouth disease and the hemorrhagic septicemia. And all the protocols can be done by three weeks and then we can remove them to the maternity and waiting to give birth. What happens when the baby arrives? After three weeks, we can start to milk the buffalo. Although the dairy milks mechanically, Susie teaches locals to milk by hand. So we'll show them how to wash the udders and do it all properly. See, lots making it look very simple. And farmers didn't know how to do this? No one knew how to do this. We first learnt this on a YouTube video. <laughs> oh, it looks like it's... Actually pinching it at the top. If you let it go, the milk goes back up. So you pull down quite firmly, pinch, and then squeeze it down. Do you want to have a go? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You come. I'll try and be as good as you. All right, so start at the top, pinch, and then all the way down. Keep going, keep going. All the way, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Yay, oh, there we go. Oh, you did it. <laughs> there we oh, go. I'm so sorry. Not brilliant, but not a complete failure. This would explain why we have 17 cats on the farm right now. <laughs> Unconventionally, Susie doesn't separate calves from their mothers. All the experts said you separate them and that's how you do it, and you feed them with bottles. Then when they would go back to the village, the babies didn't know the mothers, so they wouldn't follow the mothers back into the herds, and the farmers like, that's a bit of a problem for us. So we changed our whole system. The milk yield actually didn't drop that much, as much less work. Babies get the milk they need from their mums, so it was like, okay, we'll do it that way. I think not being a farmer you're more open to different ways of doing things. Milked once a day, volumes are low at one to two litres. The thing about buffalo milk, it's very nutritious. It does have lactose, but it has a different protein composition. And that protein composition means that for people who can't manage, say, cow's milk, there's more chance that they can manage the buffalo milk, and which is good in this part of the world. Improved care and feeding here has solved the persistent problem of poor fertility and low calf survival rates. Before the rental scheme, nearly half the calves died within the first few months. But now the buffaloes don't just return in good health, they're in calf to a bull with superior genetics. So the milk is can be increasing so from one to two, you can get four to six litre of milk from the new offspring that you get from local one, yeah. Do you have to feed more feed to uh, get that increase in milk production? It's the same amount of feed. It's the same uh, like a treatment and animal husbandry, but uh, genetic is can be impact on that part as well. The local swamp buffalo were inbred, so Susie imported riverine bulls from Sri Lanka. On the left, a Lao buffalo. On the right, a crossbred. You can see the size difference. Where that's really great for the farmers is that the males will then be like 25% bigger, just the first generation, so it's actually quite quick. Uh, and they'll be able to sell them and get more money. And the milk yield will be double what the swampies will give. But everybody was very nervous about what that was going to look like until they seeing is believing. Uh, but once they started to see, as luck would have it, the very first crossbreed went to the village chief. Pure luck. Pure luck. It was like, thank you. <laughs> So being a chef, did that help you get your head around how to make good cheese? It did. I mean, the fact that I love cheese anyways <laughs> was very helpful in learning how to do it. And here's where the increased milk goes, into specialty cheese. Susie's business partner, chef Rachel O'Shea, another Singapore expat, has learned a lot about making cheese. Our yogurt, our ricotta, mozzarella, feta, and marinated feta. Looking forward to trying this. Yum. It 
stuff, huh? Mm. Mm. I'm a yogurt lover, and that's yummy. Me too. It's tangy and smooth. Mm -hmm. But the real speciality is the handmade burrata, highly sought after by guests and nearby hotels. Once again, they turn to YouTube to learn just how to make it. So we add almost boiling water to our cut up pieces of curd to allow them to reheat and eventually come back together again. This is the first step in stretching it while you push it back together. Uh, yep. Do a little more stretching in the hand. So we'll do half of it first. Squeaky. It is squeaky. <laughs> Oh, you'll be quite strong to do that. Yeah, that's it. Look at that, that is perfect. Susie and Rachel want the dairy to have lasting social impacts, especially on child health. To encourage buffalo owners to consume more of this free protein, Rachel's adapted a dozen Lao recipes to include buffalo milk. We have buffalo milk that will add sugar, and a little bit of salt. And it is kind of like your traditional rice pudding. It's called khao tam. And then what we'll do once this is cooked is the traditional way to do it is to wrap it in banana leaf and then steam it in the banana leaf. Rachel and Susie's social responsibility goals align neatly with those of their new Australian neighbour, Agcotech. Its aim is to improve livestock health. It makes nutritional and medicinal lick blocks for buffalo and cattle. A little bit of intervention makes a huge difference. Putting blocks with these cattle sees high milk production, sees better calf survival, you see more income in families. An extra calf a year means a child can be educated. Extra milk means that that child's protein goes up through the roof. Simple intervention like that that probably we take for granted in Australia it means everything to these people here. This is where the magic happens. This is the prized machine made in Queensland by Oztac Engineering. So it's just a big mix master. Basically, it's just a giant mixing machine. The blocks are made in Laos by locals using Australian equipment and know-how. Common in Australia, lick blocks provide trace elements, minerals, salt and medication, and in drought, vital nutrients. That molasses is so sweet, what else can you sneak in there that uh, is good for the buffalo but you can mask it with that really strong taste? We put in things like fenbendazole and triclobendazole, two very, very good anti-worming agents that are by nature very, very bitter. But uh, you cloak that in a molasses block and they take their daily dose every day and virtually self-medicate themselves. Dried seaweed is imported from Vietnam, but molasses, corn, lime, salt and lemongrass are sourced in-country. The factory uses several tonnes of lemongrass a week. The real star of the show is the local lemongrass. This stuff really helps us with the methane reduction. Everyone in Lung Prabang has now realised that we're buying a lot of lemongrass and so we're getting flooded with it, which is exactly what we want. Buffalo and cattle on poor feed belch more methane. When lemongrass was added, Professor Peter Windsor measured a 25% reduction in methane. Quality of food going into the rumen, the fermentation process is as methanogenic, meaning it produces a lot of methane uh, because the bacteria in there are pro programmed for dealing with poor quality forage. So when you put in a supplementary feed, like a molasses block in there, you can change the bacterial population to produce a less methanogenic fermentation. Agcotech is focused on getting ingredients into the buffalo's stomachs so they can extract more nutrients from the poor fodder on offer. So behind me we have the local rice straw, which is what the locals feed to their cattle um, during the dry season. It's about 1% crude protein, not very good but with the blocks, they're able to digest a lot more of it. The block actually allows them to have greater access to the proteins and other minerals, vitamins within the rice straw, so it increases their milk yield, uh, how fat they get, also their ability to uh, rear calves.
At the end of the punishing six-month dry season, buffalo-fed lick blocks should be healthier and more resilient to disease and severe weather. Today we're delivering 100 blocks to Park Sea Village. There's 300 cows and buffalo in this village and 29 families. Villagers can't afford the blocks, so Chick Olsen devised a way to provide them for free. His local staff explained how the blocks reduced methane and why they could get them for nothing. They are in effect once they take a block, handing over the carbon rights for each block, which we will then go and trade on the open market. Uh, obviously, then Western democracies and Western corporations can write off their emissions by this, what's happening here today. Verifying participation in the global emissions trading scheme was low tech. A photo, a signature and a block number. Uh, we'll take a photo of him and then the four. Is this the first time they would have heard the concept or the term carbon credit? They're being brought into a larger world now. That it's, it's a strange concept that maybe some of the developing nations can do more for climate change and maybe other recalcitrant nations who are refusing to participate. So right here, right now, we can say today that putting these blocks out, you'll see a 30% direct abatement in methane, which means if Laos fed every cow tomorrow, Laos could make the, the Paris carbon pledge. Climate change isn't on the village's radar. Their priority is more and healthier buffaloes. Very happy to like get a block from the Ecotip team. And it's like full time already that they bring the block to him. And like the buffalo and the cow really like it. When he bring the buffalo or the cow to the market, it is very fat and, and it's gonna be like more expensive than before. And if like the, host, the cow or buffalo eat more blocks, it's gonna be healthier and get fat and it's like more expensive. The official opening of the block factory attracted agricultural and political dignitaries, including Australian Ambassador Paul Kelly. He's full of admiration for the farmers prepared to step into the unknown to do business with Agcotech and the Lao Buffalo Dairy. They're smallholder farmers, and for them, this is all their wealth. And to take a risk, receive this new technology, these new approaches, they're very cautious because if it doesn't work, they lose everything. So what we've already seen is a brave set of farmers who have been interested, open-minded, want to try some innovation. Uh, this whole idea, and, and I love the Australianness of this, you know, it's something that's pragmatic, it's thinking differently, and it's having a go. For Susie and Rachel and Chick and his boys, much of the hard work is done. The how is sorted and both setups are now scalable and can be replicated elsewhere. Down the road at Mrs A's, the grandkids are home from school. The loom the buffalo rental money paid for is working away as she prepares one of Rachel's buffalo milk recipes. Her family is enjoying the benefits of increased income from being involved with the dairy and the lick block company. They start investing in themselves. They start investing in their family's health. They start investing in their children's education. And we know these are the building blocks that can contribute to the development, not only of these communities, but the country. And that's the kind of thing that Australia, through its development cooperation program, is seeking to support. These kind of, not only innovative programs, but programs that are really focused on community development and sustainability. The smiles that greeted the dessert were even wider when the rains from the worryingly late monsoon finally arrived. 